incredibly short lunch break, so just uh, apologies to submitters that are in the room if there are a few councillors carrying on eating. Um, we only managed to grab 15 minutes for our lunch break, so uh, we will... Just to let you all know that uh, submitters have 10 minutes to present. That includes questions from councillors. There'll be a bell at five minutes and um, then two bells at the end of the 10 minutes. And first up, I would like to welcome the Honourable um, Stuart Nash, who is with us via Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you, Kirsten. Much appreciated. Can you hear me? Am I coming through? We can hear you, yes. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that the councillors have uh, my very brief submission in front of them. Yes, you can take that as read. Okay. okay, so there are a couple of things I, I, I'm really quite hot on. For, for probably as long as I've been an MP, um, the, the issues around Clive Square have been wearing their head, and, and it's mainly around uh, the professional businesses that operate in Clive Square uh, and... Um, and what is occurring in Clive Square. I mean, when I was growing up, when a number of us were growing up, Clive Square, Square was a safe place for people to, you know, to hang out, to rest, to eat their lunch, to socialise. It, it was an end of town that was well used by the people of Napier. It has now become what I believe uh, the Clive Square Garden, certainly in the Cenotaph lawn, has become uh, an unsafe place. My wife herself was, was assaulted. The guy was prosecuted. Uh, in front of uh, kids, she won't go there anymore. And the vast majority of Make Your People, that is a place that is no longer the safe haven that it used to be and absolutely should be. I mean, that end of town uh, should, should be a place where um, you know, that has a reputation for being safe and for where people can go. I think that one of the main problems, well, two main problems you've got there, one we're aware of, and that is... Um, the property at 25 Clive Square, a drop-in centre owned by Kyanga Aura and leased by Wit. Um, that is, uh, it, it attracts the wrong type of people. If I thought that this was a NIMBY issue, then I would have called that out years ago. I just think it is very, very poorly located. I do not believe it's a NIMBY issue because I've spoken to a number of the people who operate there and a number of the customers and clients um, of the businesses that are located there. And this is just uh, a centre that is very, very poorly positioned within our, centre, uh, within our city boundaries. But the thing that the council can do about, um, in my view, is really the, uh, um, the building which you know, used to be called, or is called, depending on what you want, it's the Woman's Rest. It is a building that has been closed since it was assessed, my understanding, by engineers as, being, um, as having earthquake uh, integrity issues. Uh, it has been, um, I think it stores library books now, there has been a fence around the majority of it. It is like an abandoned building in the middle of our city. It is where uh, people go to take drugs. Uh, it is where um, uh, drunk and drugged people go to sleep off their hangovers. And I absolutely believe that you need to find the money and there are a great de degree of urgency to do that building up and to, um, and to ensure that there is a tenant, whether it's the council or someone else, that is fit for purpose. And I think that would go a long way to actually ensuring that, um, that Clive Square is once again safe for all Napier residents, because at the moment it's just not. Um, take as read my community patrols. I'm a huge believer in community patrols. Hastings has been doing this well. There's a model there. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. And gang patches again. I mean, I, you know, I, I do believe that the council should look to ban gang patches uh, from all council-owned buildings and property. Now, you know, if, if, any, if the raids yesterday, the police bus yesterday showed us anything, it is the PR put out by a lot of these gangs is, is just that. It's PR. These gangs, by and large, they're intimidating, uh, but by and large, um, we should not allow them in council buildings. They're not allowed in government buildings or in council property. Uh, you know, you talk to people about the magnificent swings that the council has erected in Nansen Park. There's a whole lot of people that won't go near them because of gang patches. Uh, I just think that the council should, um, should ban gang patches from any council facility or grounds or buildings. And when I'm told that doesn't work, I, I disagree with that. I, I really do. In terms of freedom camping, there's a lot of work that's been done in this 
turning over to page three, there's a lot of work that's been do done on this at this point in time. I think we should, uh, should very carefully, should limit freedom camping in our city uh, to those vehicles that are self-contained or, or certainly to areas where there are um, freedom camping zones. And if people are caught camping outside the freedom camping zones as designated by the council, i.e. along we're sure, then they, uh, then they should be fined and, uh, and moved on. Um, in terms of economic development, um, I've spoken to, uh, you know, to all the mayors and the CEs in the region about this. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be brutally honest with you. We are probably one of the worst of all the regions across the country in terms of an economic, of a regional economic development agency. Uh, there is a, a substantial sum of money that uh, the government will seek to invest in regional economic development. And the way that economic development is set up across our region at the moment, uh, it will not receive any of that money. I mean, I would propose, and I'm gonna be saying the same thing to, to Mia Sandra and to Nigel, uh, that the council puts aside a, a decent amount of money for a regional economic development agency. I'll be honest again when I say that I, I, I fully support the amalgamation stance that I took all those years ago, and I think it was the right thing, but I actually did believe that what would happen once, um, once we had fought and won that battle is that our region would come together in areas where there are regional synergies, and economic development for me is the big one. Business Hawks Bay has fallen down, and I think that they perhaps only have themselves to blame, and I've, I've, I've said as much to them in terms of their lack of transparency when asking and spending ratepayers' money. I do absolutely believe there needs to be a level of transparency, but I also believe that the, uh, that the Napier City Council needs to allocate um, a decent chunk of money to a regional economic development agency in order to drive re um, regional economic development outcomes. But this is in, uh, in partnership with the other councils across the region, because as mentioned, as the person in charge of this fund uh, and having assessed or in the process of assessing all the regional economic development agencies across uh, our city, our country, I should say, we are probably, probably the bottom of all regions. And if we want to grow economic development, if we want to grow uh, economic wealth and well-being across our city and our region, then we need to take this seriously. I'll leave it at that, but happy to take questions. Um, so just with regards uh, to Clive Square, and you have identified that the property owned by Kainga Order as being a big part of the problem. Uh, now, I was in a meeting where you made a commitment to the business owners in that area to discuss uh, the sale of this property with Minister of Housing, uh, Megan Woods. I was just wondering if that conversation has been had. Yes, it has. And I was in that same meeting, Kirsten, where Witt actually offered to give up that building. Um, but, that, but I had left the meeting at the time and they were told, no, no, we would do something. I was also told that the City Council would go out and look for appropriate premises. And I'd be keen to know if they, they have done that. So I've talked to Megan about this. We are, I mean, I am, I'm pushing very hard that this building is actually uh, divested. Um, from Kaing or because as, as mentioned, it, it's just not meeting um, the needs of our city. But but this was always going to be a partnership thing. I'll do I'll do what I can at my end to absolutely ensure that that building is sold. But the council also considered going out and finding alternative premises. And my understanding is they haven't done. Ah uh, no, that's incorrect. The council is leading the working group that is investigating other locations, and that's a work in progress. Sorry, I, Sorry I, I can't hear you very well. I'm not too sure if the microphone's turned on or not. So just confirming that Council is leading the working group that is in the process of identifying possible other locations for WIT, so that is definitely a work in progress. So, 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 so when will that be, un, be undertaken? Uh, I can't give you that information right now, and we can certainly ensure that gets sent through to your office. Okay, but, but before I go, and I know I've only got 10 minutes, and I know how the uh, process we, yeah. works. Okay. We do have, I think, a number of questions, so if we could keep Okay, sure, okay, sure. happy to answer yep. them. Uh, so just with regards to the gang patches, uh, and absolutely Council, you know, understands that we have the legislation in place to do that. Uh, 
unfortunately we don't have the same levels of security within our facilities as central government and the safety of our staff is paramount. So I'd be interested to hear your ideas about how we can actually go about enforcing that legislation whilst keeping our staff safe. Well, first and foremost, I would say that this is a, uh, my understanding as I'm presenting to a long-term plan around how the council allocates its budget, its limited budget. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Napier residents, actually New Zealanders, but Napier residents find gangs intimidating. They are intimidating, and the reason they are intimidating is because they wear patches uh, that represent everything, in my view, that is reprehensible. Uh, in our communities, but they exist in our communities and we have a gang issue and as you can see again from yesterday's work, uh, there is a lot of work underway to, to solve this problem. First and foremost, you, the, the, the council should issue a notice saying that they will be banned. So that sends the first signal. The second thing is, uh, send a very clear message to the members of the public that if they see gang members wearing patches in council buildings, then they can they can call 10-5. It's the number that you call, which is a non-urgent. Uh, so call the police and ensure that you have the police on site. But also, again, um, you know, I look at what's happened in Hastings. They have community patrols. Spend a little bit of money enforcing this. Um, Kirsten, you and I have disagreed on this, and I will continue to disagree. I do not think that Napier is inherently unsafe. Uh, you know, and I'll state that. However, what I do believe is that people now are feeling uh, unnecessarily so unsafe, but they're also feeling intimidated whenever they see gang patches in areas where we have the ability to control where gangs gather. So first and foremost, issue the notice saying they'll be banned. Second, let people know that if you see gangs at Anderson Park or on our sports fields or anywhere, uh, then um, then call 10-5. The police, you know, the police probably won't turn up. They may turn up. Depends on what they've got. But if you actually send the message that this isn't acceptable, then that's the first step and the most important step, first and foremost. Thank you. I'll just open up quickly for other councillors. Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Kia ora, Stuart. Annette here. How are you? <coughs> Thank you. Hi, for... hey, so you're going to have to speak up. I'm not... To, uh... <coughs> Hi Stuart, Annette here. Annette, how are you? Hi, good, thank you. Thank you for your submission and I'd just like to commend you on taking the opportunity to make a submission to us. I think um, it's the first opportunity we've had um, to have this conversation and I think it's, it's um, very worthwhile. Um, your submission raised a number of questions for me and I'm conscious of time, Your Worship. Um, just a question, a clarification, maybe a quick one first for me on the gang patches issue. Your submission mentions that applying to all council places. Would you envision that also applying to sidewalks, streets, etc., owned by council? No, I wouldn't. I would. I would envisage it was all council buildings, facilities, and parks. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. And, and, I, and I did seek Crown Law advice on this when I was the Minister of Police, and, and Crown Law came back and said it could be done. Perfect. Thank you. Um, the second question that I have um, is around your stance on freedom camping. So your submission called for council to instigate um, a bylaw banning non-self-contained freedom campers and clamp offenders up to $200 uh, a clamp, or you said no less than $200. I'm just really conscious um, that I think this current government passed re legislation last year under the Land Transport Act which clamped the maximum fee or topped the maximum fee as $100 for clamping. So I'm just interested in your view um, if you believe council could recover the cost of clamping enforcement if we were to budget something new in this space, or, or being that government's given us a maximum fine of $100, what your, what your view on the practicality of that would be? My understanding is the freedom camping, the maximum fine is $200. You do raise a good point. I will, if, if possible, um, council, I'll get back to you on that. Okay, perfect, thank you. You raise a good point though. Thank you. And the last question, it may have been partly answered, Your Worship, in, in your question to Stuart, but it was around the antisocial behaviour and you, you rightly, I suppose, attribute that um, to the, the Crown-owned property down, the, down, in, um, down in Clive Square there. I'm, I'm just trying to collate that with, I think, your submission later calls for council um, when we're making urgent works to, to the woman's rest to ensure that any tenant we have, and I quote from your submission, is of good character and does not attract the sort of people who are responsible for perpetuating this kind of antisocial behaviour. So it was really good to hear that you're having conversations on the potential sale of that site um, and the management of your tenant. Um, I'm just trying to collate that with the, the later... Um, 
part of your submission when you talk about derelict and dilapidated properties. I, I note, um, and we've had a few submitters raise this, that the, the Crown-owned kind of social housing is a big issue um, in, in that space, and I'm just interested in your role as a, as a Crown tenant that you see in there. Uh, if, if you can highlight to me any Crown buildings of that uh, in that um, state, then I am more than welcome to take that up with the Minister to ensure that they are that they're sorted. My, I, I'm not aware of any state houses in that state, but but please let me know if there are and I'll take that up. I suppose what I'm, I'm talking about uh, is buildings where the... My understanding, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, there are a number of buildings around our city which are, which are quite dilapidated uh, and, and are not inhabited. These are owned by private residents, and I, you know, I would like to see some form of bylaw. And, I, and I'm not talking about people who are not mowing their lawns. Please don't get me... Uh, misunderstand I'm talking about houses that are that are simply um, not inhabited because they're in such a state that uh, they are uninhabitable and I think that what they what they often do is they bring down neighborhoods um, and I think that something needs to be done with regard to those but but please if there are any state houses that you feel are in a dilapidated way or uninhabitable please let me know and I, I will absolutely take that up uh, with Kainga Aura. Thank you, a really good assurance there, Stuart, and thank you again mm. for making the submission. It's good to have you um, come and talk to us. Thank you. Um, conscious of time, so yes, thank you very much, Stuart. Um, certainly it's the first time in my time on council that we've had the local MP make a submission. We really appreciate it. Um, and I'm sure you've got a busy day ahead, so thank you for your time. Thank you, and good luck with your deliberations. You do a fantastic job, all of you, and um, you, know, I've, uh, you lead our city well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, and next I'd like to invite Tom Little, who is also happens to be one of our youth councillors, uh, to come and have his submission. We're going to do a joint... Yeah. Perfect. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, my name is Joy Markini and I am a teacher down at Bledisloe Primary School. Um, we were thrilled to be uh, invited by uh, Duncan and Tom to come and also uh, submit um, on the safety of our area. Uh, I do road duty once a week and so do these children along with many others um, and they have a few things that they'd like to share so thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Lexi. The council has said in their consultation paper that safety is important to us all. When we feel safe, we have the freedom to go about our lives more confidently. I'm Angelique, hi. We are some of the road wardens from Billisloe Primary School along Miani Road, just on the Mercery Road corner. We like keeping everyone safe, but some days we don't feel able to do that very easily. Hi, I'm Dakota, and we have had a lot of close calls at our crossings, especially with cars turning left from Murphy Road onto Miani Road. The lights are green and then the red arrow goes away just when our families and students go onto the crossing. Also, the crossing lines, lines need repainting, as you can see here in these, this photo. And there is one. There is a tree on the right side blocking one of the lights over here. Even though there are two signs that ask turning traffic to give way to walkers on the crossing, they often don't do this and get annoyed and inch forward while people are still crossing the road. We think it would be good to make all of our area down Murphy Road and from the Gapu Road lights up Miani Road to Lee's Road lights into a 40 kilometre zone. Three schools use this area and it is very busy in the mornings between 8 and 9am and in the afternoon between 2.45 and 3.30. It feels dangerous to us. People are afraid to use the road and end up biking on the footpath. We wonder if speed bumps along the road would help. It is a narrow road with cars on both sides, so where can we put cycle lanes? 
We hope that we can solve these problems if we all work together. Hi, I'm Odin. Thank you for listening to our submission. We hope that we can all work on our way to have a safe area for our students and their families. Thank you. Now you can take those down and give them to the mayor, please. Thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Welcome, Libby. We not get questions. Um, <laughs> so <we> swap. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Libby, and I'm a Year Thirteen student at Tarot High School who often bikes and walks to and from school. Um, I'm re really concerned about my safety and the safety of other students. I've been hit by numerous vehicles and have found that cars and cyclists don't mix well. The first time I got hit while biking was down Avenue Road and a white truck came speeding out of the driveway and right into me, causing me to fall off and graze my hands and knees. The second time I was biking towards school one day down Lee Road and a ca car came up so close behind going around the corner into Petty Street. He nearly hit me and it really scared me. Another truck going through a roundabout nearly hit me while biking home from work one night. I came up to the roundabout and I was going straight through and this car came speeding through and we both braked just in time before we collided. These experiences are super scary to go through and now have impacted the way I bike to and from school. I'm often scared when I bike on the road. I keep thinking someone is going to hit me again, like the time I got hit just down, by, down the road by the clock tower. Injuring my arm, it was extremely sore, and when I got to school, my hand was bleeding. I had to go to the office for an ice pack on my arm and a bandage for my hand. I had to go to work after school, and my arm was still sore from getting hit that morning. I went even though the pain of my arm was in agony. My colleagues wondered what was wrong and I told them and they were all completely shocked and said I wasn't supposed to be at work. I needed to keep going though because no one was able to take my place. Luckily it was just a sprain. Whenever I'm biking to school now, I'm terrified when cars come too close to me. I end up biking on the footpath because that is where I feel safe. Therefore, we need proper bike lanes on the way to school so these things don't happen. I read an article about a young lady who got killed from a car while biking. Michelle, who was a fourth grade teacher at Menlo Park School, was struck by a car that drifted into her and killed her. She was an experienced cyclist wearing a helmet. I'm really concerned about the safety of students biking to and from school on Murphy Road. I have seen what happens when cyclists are not separated from cars. Please help make Murphy Road safer by separating students from the ferocious traffic. Thank you very much, Libby, for uh, sharing your experiences with us. I can understand why you're feeling uh, unsafe when you're cycling on the roads when you've had a number of obviously quite scary experiences. Um, I will just see if any of the councillors have any questions for you. Councillor McGrath. Thanks for coming and um, letting us know this. I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity that this group can work with our roading people um, directly and come up with some solutions. That's certainly something we can discuss further during our deliberations, Councillor McGrath. That's what I'd say on the <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Cool, thank you for having me. And yeah, I'm Campbell Gray, and um, we're here together to uh, present this because we're both road cyclists that race competitively, and um, we also both bike to school, and we uh, face half as many issues on the road racing as we do biking to school. Yeah, um, we're really concerned about the Murphy Road traffic problem, um, and yeah, we'll share our ideas and uh, unpack the problem. So um, at the moment, uh, Murphy Road uh, faces large congestion problems. Cyclists and pedestrians are facing safety issues. 
Sorry, Tom, to interrupt you, but for the live streaming purposes, I'm sure you don't want all of them to miss out what you've got to say if you couldn't mind using the speaker. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, as you can see here, we've got nearly a thou uh, 2,000 students entering and exiting the school in the, uh, in the school starting hours and ending period. Um, and both Miani and Murphy Roads are unsafe for cyclists and pedestrians, and we believe it needs to be changed. Uh, yeah, so we have students with ongoing near misses, uh, accidents resulting in grazes, bruises and concussions, and even broken bones, because it's, qu so it's quite serious, this problem. Yeah, the risks we face are the parents dropping off our students on Murphy Road. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't allow our space for the 1.5 metres recommended space to give a cyclist. Um, that means we, some cyclists have to mount the kerb and uh, ride alongside pedestrians using that path. Um, our last problem is there's um, minimal road markings. Eh? Um, on Miani Road, we've seen that we've had a cycle lane, but it just ends at both the lights. Mm. Yes, yeah, so there's, it, it's absolute mayhem on Murphy Road at uh, 3.15 when school finishes, but we've got the three schools, Bledisloe, Teradale and Teradale Intermediate, and um, this kit's completely packed with cars, and uh, there's about 150 uh, cyclists at Teradale who bike to and from school, and it's, it's a real issue. Um, uh, students are using the footpath instead of the road because they're worried and it's also it, it also concerns the drivers because they're concerned about you know hitting uh, cyclists hitting kids so they, they have to really be careful um, so the laws and regulations around cycling we had a look at Waka Kotahi's uh, cycling road code and they uh, described that we have to stay as far left as possible but the problem we face is when cars are, car uh, cars are parked on the side of the road, we can't stay as far left, and we have to enter the, the driving lanes. And that's just unsafe, and it causes harm for the driver knowing that there's a cyclist in front or behind them. Um, we're also not, not allowed to use the uh, pathways, but as you know, everyone does, because that's the safest way, and that's how we keep the most safe. Yeah, so here are some photos. So uh, if, if you can see, up on the right hand corner, that's what it's like, you know, and um, that's not as busy as it gets, but there's lots of um, students not separated from the traffic on the road and um, students getting picked up, so it's really dangerous. Yeah, just one thing in this photo of our students crossing the road, we don't have a um, pedestrian crossing outside our school, so that's one thing that we also face, not only as cyclists, but as pedestrians. So we have three different ideas, so, so you can consider. Um, our first one is a segregated cycle and skateboard path. So this would go, uh, it's like the one on the right hand side in the photo, and it would go along Murphy Road and it would cons completely separate um, uh, cyclists from the traffic. So that, that would be the ultimate, um, and yeah. Uh, the second would be uh, timed parking zones. Yeah, and then we've got speed bumps just to slow down the traffic. The only problem with the speed bumps is they don't separate the uh, cyclists from cars. Um, segregated cycleways, we've seen them being put in on uh, Napier Road out in Havelock, and uh, that's been hugely used by myself and many others. Mm -hmm. um, it just allows that there's a physical segregation between the cars and cyclists. That just gives cyclists and vehicle users the peace of mind of not having to interact. Um, relating it to our school, we have parents dropping, our, drop, well, dropping their kids off, but to make them feel more safe when children are walking or biking to school is not being in the line of traffic. Um, and then that also means that drivers don't have to worry about the cyclists. Um, yeah, so he, basically the segregated um, pathway idea is that, you know, there'd be a segregated path completely along Murphy Road, and then it would connect up to the Napier Highway pathways, so it'd be really safe for students and uh, the general public getting to Taradale, getting into Murphy Road, um, and it wouldn't hinder parking, which we'll go into again very shortly, um, and there'd be gaps in the driveway for cars to... Uh, you know, access. Yeah, one thing with these segregated cycleways is both directions can use one, so we only have to have it on one side of the road. 
um, and that just allows public to use the highway cycle paths to get from Taradale up onto the limestone tracks more safely and less worries. Um, going along with the uh, lights, as we have in that photo up on the right hand side is um, a seg uh, separate light for cyclists. That just means that they don't have to worry about cars when they're turning at the lights. Um, so this is another idea, um, timed parking zones. So basically what it would mean that cars could park along Murphy Road for a certain amount of time and then it would be cleared uh, for students to be able to, you know, bike and it would not be, uh, there would not be cars hindering them. Um, this isn't really the best idea as who's going to control, uh, you know, looking after uh, and keeping cars out of the way. Um, yeah, majorly we just want to keep Murphy Road clear because that's the main road that we use to get to and from school. And if that means that children have to walk, uh, parents have to park slightly further away so their kids have to walk a slight bit further to pick them up, we don't worry about that one. Uh, the third idea is uh, speed bumps. Now, this isn't a great idea, but it will <coughs> completely slow down Murphy Road, which could help, but it won't... Um, it won't separate cyclists from cars. So we'll still have the problem with, um, you know, people hitting cars and cars hitting cyclists. Um, yeah, so if you, as you've heard, you've um, heard from Bledisloe and they uh, want this changed. We've also got Mr Wilson of the principal of Taradale Intermediate who also supported us. He couldn't be here today to help us present this, but this is what he's had to say. As a cyclist, he also bikes to school and he has problems crossing, turning right into Murphy Road and coming to, coming to work in school. Um, he believes that something needs to be done about it because he is scared for his own safety and the student's safety. All right, so your concerns. So we saw the management comments. Um, the main one was that um, it would compromise parking. So um, we had a thought about this, and look, you're wrong, it won't. Um, <laughs> if, you can, if, if you can see it, this photo here, this is during the day, and there's, there's hardly any people parking along here. There might be a dozen cars or so, but it will not compromise parking. Um, yeah, the, the safety of our students is more important than a dozen or so car, uh, parking spots. Um, those cars which are, their parking is compromised, uh, they can easily park down like uh, Jeffreys or uh, some of those side streets. I can't remember all of them, but yeah. So the main use is from parents picking up and dropping off students and not people parking all day, as we can see in those photos. So do you care about the well-being and safety of children? Oh, look, we're sure you do, and <laughs> we do as well. Um, uh, we want to ensure our students are safe. Um, and what if it was your child in this situation, if they were being, uh, if, if their safety was jeopardised every day? Um, what, if you were do what would you do if you were driving the car? And yeah, so there's, there's many different factors. Um, we do care about the well-being and safety of children and we want you to help us make Murphy Road safe for the hundreds of students who use it daily. Yeah, as a council, we know you're, you guys are open to helping children and grow up in this safe community, and we'd just like to put this one forward to help us get to that. So we'd just like to say thank you for listening to us, and we're happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. That is a really well prepared submission, very impressed, and the fact that you actually took the time to look at the management comments and provide some responses to that as well. So well done, and also well done to Libby and the Bledisloe students. Um, great to have you all here today to present on this, and I can see that Councillor Simpson is wanting to ask a question. I do, thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Um, Thank you for the presentation from the three schools and the different ages of um, students from within the Taradale environment. I know what I have said at previously at council meetings about the Murphy Road environment. What's your view or what's your response if I was to say to you that council doesn't intend to review parts of Taradale traffic management for another six years? Oh, well, we, we would say that you really need to rethink that decision. As we've, as we've explained in this submission, that there is an underlying problem, um, and why don't, do you not want students to be safe? Do you not want children to be safe? Because their safety is being jeopardised, and that should not be happening. Um, honestly, from me, I'd be gutted about that, and I believe that 
if you don't work on it in the next six years, there will be a problem, a serious one. Thank you. Councillor Crystal, then Councillor Crown. Thanks for coming to present. I was lucky enough to be the councillor that these guys approached and came and watched um, a morning down at uh, Murphy Road Chaos. Um, U-turns in front of students, um, and that was just, I think I stood there for about quarter of an hour or 20 minutes. So um, I'm really glad that you guys have done an amazing submission, and I totally um, think that uh, it certainly needs to be looked at. And I really welcome anyone else to go down there and watch it in a morning or afternoon. So thanks, guys. Councillor Crown. It's lovely to see um, that you two have a couple of um, fierce Taradale ward councillors um, in your <laughs> corner already. Um, but my question, I suppose, when I um, reflect on your submission and when I was reading through it as well, um, you did do a blooming good job of it, so congratulations. And I'm just wondering how it um, may also apply to other areas within our city. Um, you know, we, we have multiple schools, etc., and wondering um, if you looked any wider as to what the um, concerns might be in, in other areas. Yeah, well, uh, we know that there are other problems in Napier, especially with Nap uh, I think the school's located on the hill. But, um, yeah, I think um, at, at the moment, Taradale um, and Murphy Road is quite a severe problem because it, it, it's every day and it's, it's, it's uh, really impacting students. And, yeah, so I think definitely look out at our submission and look at uh, if there are other submissions regarding... Uh, uh, traffic and similar situations, definitely look at them because the, the safety of students is really important. I would just say that um, ours is probably a bit more severe just because of the close proximity of the three schools. Um, and with that, it's for the public as well. Um, we'd like to help boost the regional development of those cycle pathways because it's been an awesome thing to watch them grow over the past few years and I, as a cyclist I've used them all and I love that we can get around Napier without having to go on the road and worry about vehicles. Um, so yeah, as Tom said on the hill that would be a good one to look at also but I just believe the close proximity of the three schools is a major problem. Thank you. Thank you once again for your time. Sorry, we don't have time for any more questions. <laughs> um, but I'm sure that um, if, if you were happy for any councillors to contact you and ask any follow-up questions they may have, then we can arrange for that to happen. Uh, so really appreciate you taking the time not only to prepare, but also come and speak to us today. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Cheers. Sweet. I'd like to invite Craig Waterhouse, please, uh, the Regional Indoor Sports and Events Centre Trust. Welcome. This is your place. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I tried to justify charging you rent, um, but I figured you paid for it at, uh, in town, so, uh, but if you want it for nothing, just tell somebody. Um, thank you very much. I'll just make sure this works all right. And... Uh, Maybe it works this way, does it? So, I'll sit down, I guess. Big, big, big thank you. We've got this far. Your support has been a cornerstone for us getting to where we've got. Um, Steph asked me at lunchtime as she was heading out when I thanked her for the letter we used to the Significant Project Fund, how we'd got along, and Craig Irison has confirmed we got $3 million from them which is fantastic to be able to put a project together for Hawke's Bay, which uh, will probably cl cost close to $18, 19000000 million, and uh, we're able to raise most of the money. So thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much to all your guys. I mean, this has been probably 15 years in the making. Uh, Councillor Wright was chairman for a while, and uh, she saw the issues Sports Hawke's Bay had raised. Uh, uh, in terms of the shortage of indoor court space. So it's uh, fantastic that uh, we are starting. You, uh, We haven't actually moved anything, except if you look next door on the way out, you'll see a container with a pile on it. So the car park uh, next door will begin soon. That's just a bit of graphics. Uh, 
in terms of our cultural design team and we've actually got a meeting this afternoon at three. I'm gonna to talk to you about the failed plan that you guys spent so much time on helping us with a car park over the stock bank. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about trying to get some additional operational funding into the plan long term, asset renewal stuff, some inflation adjustment, and finally I'll talk to you about uh, uh, a project going forward in terms of reviewing how we operate. This is your place, very much your place. It'll be the biggest investment ever in the future well-being of youth of Hawke's Bay. It's a massive investment we're making in what are very big sports. When we started PGA, basketball was a sport played outside in many schools. Um, it's now the biggest secondary school sport in New Zealand. Volleyball is now the fastest growing secondary school sport in New Zealand. So we've got a huge, uh, huge demand that we've never experienced before. 90% of our users are youth under age of 19. 30% are under, or from three to 11. We don't have any two-year-olds playing here. Um, and we've got a dominance of all the sports we have here in Maori and Pacifica. Hawke's Bay is a higher proportion than New Zealand, and we've got a massive proportion in youth compared to adults. And you're really catering, this place will cater for team sports in that space, and as a result, the well-being of parents participating and supporting their children will be fantastic as well. And I just thought I'd share this one with you. I'm gonna have to turn around on this to make sure I get it right. but. Some time ago, you guys uh, had a meeting and agreed that we put a car park over the stock bank. We went to the regional council and the regional council also voted unanimously. We thought, right, we're sweet here. That was, I think about November, December last year. In February, the council officers confirmed that we could only go too wide and that it was impossible to fit the number of car parks we wanted to. At the meeting in November, December, the, in the regional council one, the officer had hinted at that, but we thought there would be, uh, uh, at least we might be able to get away with four wide, which would allow us to put a car park over there. So we had to make massive changes, and we're now with the blessing of uh, e uh, EIT, um, leasing some land off them, or you are, uh, hopefully, uh, at no cost to put car parks along there. We're putting car parks in there. We're putting car parks out the front. We're putting car parks there. We're putting car parks there. We're putting car parks there. So as a result of that, we've significantly had to change our plan, which was disappointing and also disappointing to our budget because this is what it's done. These are estimates, but appreciate that we were looking at $800,000 for a car park over the stop bank. Those change of, pla of plans means we're spending 2.6, okay? And uh, we'd like a helping hand there, and if you would please consider the possibility of taking $600,000 out of your car park fund and helping out. Appreciate appreciating this morning's presentation where uh, you are spending a lot of money on car parks, but our car park is used as the starting point for many people on the bike trail. So our car park's probably the biggest uh, serviced car park that's used for the bike trail. And if you come along here Saturday morning, you'll see that. So we would like some your consideration of operational support. You give us 55 now for three courts. We'd like you to think long term that that's likely to go up. Um, and maybe in year two of your plan, you consider putting something in there to support us. Similarly so with your annual renewal for our, our asset renewal, sorry, you put 35 at the, 30 at the moment. We'd like you to consider putting 90 in in a three year term. We'd also like you to uh, think about inflation adjusting those amounts so we're not coming to you when we're running short, but just continually to put it in there. So, 
just to think we'd like some support for civil works as a result of the Hawke's Bay Regional Council declining our car parking option. We'd like operational support, asset support and inflation adjustment if possible. We'd also like to put our hand up and say, hey, in about three years' time, we think you should look at the model. Um, we've just had Dan, our manager, leave and go and work for McLean Park. And there are some different ways you can do things, and we'd really like some support from you guys to fund a review that says, well, is this the right model? Should this be run by council outright? So thanks. Help us to help you and your youth. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Craig. I'll open up to councillors for any questions they may have. <coughs> Councillor McGrath. Who, who sets the requirement for the number of car parks you need? Uh, Richard might want to answer that. <laughs> Just the reason I ask that is because every, you know, everyone comes in and says, take your bike, don't build car parks. Oh, Richard. But, <laughs> <laughs> leave, leave Richard alone. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, you guys? <laughs> That's all <Yeah>. I know. <laughs> Sorry about that. Council. <laughs> Hey, we're pretty pretty generous though. Uh, just to say, we use in terms of our total numbers, our major use requirement is outside operating AIT hours, so we can use over the road and whatnot. It's surprising though. I had someone say to me the other day, "Oh, I had to park out there back the other day when we had netball. You don't have enough parks out the front." <laughs> <laughs> That's me. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, Councillor Brown. Um, in your summary there about the moving from the 800,000 car park to the 2,600,000, two, oh, yeah. um, you had that you needed to create a temporary car park, mm -hmm. which cost 800,000, and then you had to remove that, which cost 200,000. What was the rationale between uh, of <laughs> needing to create that and then remove it? Um, I don't know. Was it part of the submission that we were required to remove it? When we finished. Sorry, it's a Napier City Council requirement. That I want to be as polite as possible, but as far as we're aware, it's a Napier City Council requirement. Or a temporary one. Yes, and it must be made permanent because for 12, 12 months. And that's fair enough. Thank you. And it's a requirement to remove it. Uh, Craig, I've just crunched the numbers a bit, and um, it looks to me like at the moment, and wonderful news that you've had three million yeah. confirmed. Um, so you're still looking at a shortfall of 3.25 million? Uh, we're saying four because uh, everything I touch costs more money. <laughs> uh, and so you, I note that you have made a number of applications to various... Yes. Yeah. And so essentially today what you're asking for from us, from a capital perspective, would be just the 600,000 yes. for the park, car park. Yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Taylor. Uh, just, just a quick question. Um, you identified where you're going to put car parks, and there appeared to me to be one in an area of um, significance out towards the road. Yes. Has that been clarified that yes. you can? We're not putting car parks where the uh, stone is that is out the front, which is part of the old stop bank. Okay. So uh, the rest of it's part of the plan. Thank you. But well, it's quite interesting that, that that big stone out the front takes a, a lot of potential car parks. Thank you very much for your time today, Craig. And once again, congratulations on the $3 million grant. That's great news. I'd now like to invite the representative from Blokehart Hawke's Bay, please. Kia ora I'm John Marshall, President of Blokehart Hawke's Bay. Welcome, John. Thank you. So um, the first thing I'd like to do is say thank you. Um, Napier City have been very good to us. Um, I think we've had over 70,000 um, in funding from Napier City Council, and that has allowed us to uh, produce 
probably a $350,000 asset for the city in terms of the Blokart track and the facility that we have on Lagoon Farm. So without you guys, with the support from council, we wouldn't be there and we wouldn't have this fantastic um, facility. Um, a couple of uh, things just to set the scene. We're the fastest growing club in the country. Uh, we started off with 15 members and we've got well over 80 now. We've got more youth members than any other club in the country and it's all really pretty exciting. We have um, an enthusiastic crew of retired folk who provide have a go options for uh, members of the public to come and have a go. And over 1,200 of Napier and Hastings uh, folk have done just that in the last couple of years. So uh, there's a lot to be um, um, proud of in terms of the last couple of years. So um, you can see, I won't read them all, but we've hosted a number of regional and national events which have brought people into Napier for a number of days on end and uh, that's got to be good for the city. So, why am I here? Um, part of the regional plan, as I understand it, is to look at the future of Lagoon Farm and to look at um, some kind of a wetlands sediment uh, retention scheme to prevent sediment getting into the Ahuriri. And, um, we think that's a great idea, um, but we'd like to be part of it, saying we're going to be neighbours. So um, this is what we currently have. Uh, this, the rectangle in the middle is the 8,000 square metres of uh, track that we originally put in. The pink bit was what the uh, grant that we got from council last time round helped us extend uh, our track. Um, so that's great, and it's working really, really well, but there's always a bigger track. <laughs> so um, I don't know what Council's vision for a wetland is between us and Ahriri, um, but you can see what we think would be quite cool to do to our track. And we think we're totally compatible with a wetland. Look at all that water around us. We think that'd be quite cool. And we think that people would like to cycle around that. And so, um, look, I don't know what your vision for the wetland is going to look like, but I would love to be part of, of the discussion when it comes time for designing what that wetland will do and how it's going to absorb the sediment. Um, and um, it would turn what I think is a pretty awesome facility into a fantastic one. It would mean if we had something like that, um, we would be able to bid for a world championships in Napier. goes without saying, I think we've got to be one of the most environmentally friendly sports um, that I can think of, other than tiddlywinks. And uh, it's, I think, well, ju just judging by the number of passers-by who stop and have a look at these colourful sails whizzing around on the, the corner of Prevenson Drive, um, it, I think it's a great spectacle for people arriving into Napier. So um, that's really all I wanted to say. Um, we, um, we would love to be part of the discussion and of any development of the Lagoon Farm. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, John. And it certainly sounds like your club is going from strength to strength. It's great to hear. Uh, do we have any questions from councillors? Deputy Mayor Brosnan. Thank you, John. Just very briefly from me, um, I had the opportunity to take my staff on a try it session for our work do last year and everyone loved it. It was a fantastic um, sport you have there and congratulations to your team that run that. Um, just flagging that I think you, you are a natural, affected and interested party um, if Council was to improve, uh, approve investment into the regional park and thank you for highlighting um, that to us and, and uh, 
yeah, it's a really delicate balance what we're wanting to achieve there, but um, certainly to be part of the conversation I think is, is vital. We'd be thrilled to offer a team building exercise for council if, uh, in the future. Excellent. We're looking, we're looking forward to it. <laughs> with, with some of the wind that comes out of here, the speed will be. <laughs> Doesn't look like there's any other questions, so thank you once again for your time today, John. Very good, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Speaking from experience. I'd like to invite up Angie Denby from the Ahariri Estuary Protection Society, please. Welcome, Angie. Thank you. Greetings to the Mayor and Councillors. Thank you for this opportunity. And an interesting um, conjunction with the previous <laughs> speaker. <laughs> right. First of all, I'd just like to say thank you for your document with your officer's um, summary of what the submissions have said. Unfortunately, we're not actually on the list of people that have commented on the um, regional park. But hopefully um, we can go on to it at some stage. So it was sort of with some relief that um, we saw that your focus was conservation. Because as you've probably gathered from lots of feedback is we felt confused and we weren't the only ones. Especially because of the map with the lagoon farm and the big green area, it seemed like the regional park was um, going a, a very wide distance and that recreation was sounding like it was being balanced out with conservation. So yet to be clarified, really. So uh, in a way, it's not surprising the reaction of a number of groups. But hopefully uh, the things that conservationists have brought up um, will give you material for the master plan when you continue to work on that. Because as far as I know, that hasn't been updated since 2017. And um, the regional park idea has certainly brought new possibilities. So we did submit on the three waters, the storm water and the regional park, but I'd like to focus on the regional park. So the idea of new wetlands uh, for helping filter the storm water sounds really good. And uh, we're right behind the environmental solutions team that are doing their three years of monitoring, getting their data so that they know what's exactly going into the water. So to know whether, where the treatment will be, whether there'll be bits of treatment up the stormwater system or what needs to be there for the wetland. Uh, one of the things I've gathered from listening to other submitters is the invasive tube worm is really going under the radar in lots of ways. That there's been a little bit of removing it, but it hasn't solved the problem, so that seems to be an enormous problem. Um, creating coral-like structures, solid structures that they've had to use mechanical diggers to get out. So that's a bit of a worry, because I hear it's going into the urban waterways. It's now in the Clive River under the bridge there. It's going up the Tuki Tuki um, where it meets the sea. So it's a big problem. Uh, there's ongoing tension, of course, between conservation and recreation, and that will probably always be the case, but when we hear whispers about jet skis up the channel, when um, there's not meant to be any motorised vehicles beyond the bridge over the Pandora, the road, the Miani Key, 
Um, what I hear there is perhaps commercial interests coming into development. Nothing's on paper yet, but um, we hear about it. Uh, mistakes have been made in the past. The expressway bridge where the traffic goes across the estuary on the new expressway, that was to be a fully spanned bridge up until the last minute, and then for, for costs, it was um, sort of half filled in on each side. And if I'm correct, I hear that's causing problems in the estuary now with a bottleneck, because the water doesn't flow freely. I don't know, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and cycling close to the birds, a big concern. And I hear about uh, plantings of native trees in, in inappropriate places for estuaries. So all these things need to be very carefully talked about. So for us, uh, the big issues to focus on is climate change, which in a sense is almost a nebulous problem, but the big deluge certainly woke us up to the possibilities. Pollution into the estuary. Like, to us, that comes before anything else. And that would be the sediment from the hillsides, the tube worm, the stormwater with sewage in it when that has to happen, uh, the pollution from the industrial area. They're all important things. And I guess what jumped out to us mostly from the plan was what appeared to be lack of consultation. <laughs> but I've heard since then that it was just a concept being put out. And it was very surprising that the Department of Conservation hadn't been part of any of it, when, especially when they have jurisdiction over a lot of that land that you're talking about. OK. So that's all. That's your five-minute bell, if you were... Oh, no, that's Thanks. enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've heard this, some of these things over and over lately. Thank you, Angie. Uh, mm. Are there any questions for Angie? Deputy Mayor Brosnan. <laughs> um, thank you, Angie, and um, thank you for the, you know, the conversations that, we, that we've had over this project. And I just, um, like I've done with, with some other submitters, just wanted to reassure you that um, the regional park proposal is planned just to be on the, the 284 hectares of council-owned um, land at Lagoon Farm, not into, to say, the Department of Conservation jurisdiction space. Um, and that if council is to agree through this process to con put money in its 10-year plan, we will be going through um, a full consultation and partnership process to develop that master plan. Um, and as we've heard through various other submitters, through some so, uh, quite a lot of detail to get that design right um, and uh, with that conservation focus as well. Mm. Thanks for your time. Thank you for your time, Angie. And next, I'd like to invite June Graham, please. Take your time. holding everybody up. No, that's fine, June. It's good to have you with us. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can. Uh, I'm June Graham. I live at Taradale in the Masonic units. That's a good plug, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I live in Taradale, of course, 
I'm here today in support of the Ahiriri Protection Society submission and the points they raise. I'm also a member of Forest and Bird and support this submission as well. Uh, but I speak for myself, not on the behalf of any of these groups today, and I wanted to express my views and concerns. After all, you're really a captive audience, aren't you? And it's not very often we get you all together to have our say. Um, the picture of Napier, it won't be easy for you to see, but I can leave it up there and collect it later if you want to leave it there, gives an idea. Uh, um, the picture of Napier and its environs give a good overall view of the estuary location and its size. I'm not sure where the boundaries are in the park area. Um, it, it shows a big comparison between the estuary size and Napier overall. It serves a, it serves a, a wide area of, for purification of anything sediment that comes down. I have lived in Hobart, Tasmania for many years, near Cremorn on the eastern shore of the Derwent. Part of my property contained Rushy Lagoon, uh, near Pipe Clay Lagoon. Rushy Lagoon has 10 owners. It is an ephemeral lagoon with plenty of snakes, eels, and of course, bird life. I only say that to show where my interest came into wetlands. Living there has given me an insight and understanding of the importance and vulnerability of wetlands and estuaries and other environmental issues. My, move, my involvement in the coast care and land care in the, the area, this in turn led, became, I became involved and interested, interested in local government. After all, you have a lot to do with this part of the world. The, and government's role is in sensitive environment and management. When I returned home about 2006, I retained this interest and passion. So here I am, part of the Ahariri Estuary Protection Society. I am not an expert, nor do I have the answers to the threat facing the estuary. I doubt if the general public realise how vital it is to our health and well-being, the sensitive area. Uh, we put a lot of pollutants, certainly in some cases accidentally, but now the powers that be, which of course is you, have, excuse me, I'm starting to stutter a bit, but the powers that be have, I'm having trouble reading my writing, fairly recently become aware of taking action to limit the damage better late than never. I believe we have reached a dangerous point. The, the phrases used recent, lately are tipping point and balance. Our estuary as never before is threatened if the balance between the environment and recreation use is not recognized. We all will need to make some sacrifices if this is to be successful. I'm not telling you anything you don't know already. It's like I'm, like, it's like I'm teaching my mother to suck eggs. A lot of work is being done in preparation for improving this situation. The results, as I understand it, will be in soon. Time is of the essence in this matter. I'd like to pay a tribute to our volunteers who have for many years perse persevered in the battle for rec recognition, recognition of the estuary's need for protection. Isabel Morgan, Sue MacDonald, and others part and presence. Isabel in her final time and I must mention here that her daughter Helen was a great help as, she, as Isabel got frailer. Isabel once said, even though we don't always get all we would like, at last she felt hope for the future of the estuary. We are making progress. Small as it may be, we are progressing. If the treatment of stormwater and runoff is not addressed urgently, it seems to me difficult or even impossible to stop the health of the estuary's decline. Indeed, the loss of habitat would be tragic. I recognise the importance of pre pre of rec I, I'll start again. I recognise the importance of recreation for the well-being of the community, but the plan for the park should not allow 
any more access for cyclists or, uh, or, walk or tracks within its boundaries. I don't say remove the ones that are there already. No, put, don't put any more in the sensitive areas and disturb the habitat. Mother Nature is saying this now, take care. After reports are in and, and actions decided, let nature heal itself. We, will, we all will need to make sacrifices to achieve the health of the estuary over time. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. Every action has a reaction. Hopefully we have learned from the past. I use the example of the bottleneck and the x-ray bridge. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, are there any questions from councillors? Thank you, June, for your ongoing commitment to our estuary, and I know you've uh, many, many years championed on behalf of it. So thank you for coming today. My pleasure. And thank you. Squeaky hands gets the most oil. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Will I leave the map? Would you like me to leave the map? Would anyone like to have a closer look at the map, or...? No, I think we're okay, thanks, June. I'd like to invite Philip and Yvonne Coonrod up to present, please. Welcome, Philip and Yvonne. Thank you. Hi. <coughs> Hi, I'm better known as Evie. Um, <coughs> Evie Coonrod. Um, Phil and I are residents of the Oxford Street Centennial Village. Um, and we're really just here. I had no idea this was what was in front of me. I thought it was a one-on-one, -on -one, <laughs> so I can tell you this is a challenge. <laughs> um, we're here really because of the insecurity everybody in our village is feeling with the money situation for the council retirement village because that's where we come from. Um, not our choice to be in one of those, but we're very grateful that it's there for us. And every single person in those villages has a story to tell, and some of them are quite sad. But we're just kind of weary of never having any security and always being threatened that we could lose our homes. And that's why we're here today. And it's always, we've been there eight years now, Phil? Uh, more than nine. Nine years. And every time we ask for something, we kind of feel guilty because we're going to take some of the money, which we feel should have been um, saved for those particular occasions through our rentals. We know that our rentals are lower than market rentals, but that's what it's there for. It's a safety net for the elderly who don't have anywhere else to go. And um, we're just really tired and weary, I think, I'm 76, Phil 74, and I think when you get to this age, he's my toy boy, I think when you get to this age that you, you should have some sense of security, that you don't have to always be concerned about maybe asking for something that your flat needs. When we moved into our unit, we, um, Phil was made redundant, um, and so we used that little bit of redundancy. We never had a thing done for us. We had to paint, wallpaper, um, carpet, drapes, nothing. I know that was eight years ago or nine years ago, so it's kind of, you know, not your problem. But we did all that. We put a heat pump in simply because I can't take hot summers. Um, and we had to pay for that. It was 2200 or something. And we had to sign it over to the council. 
um, we don't mind. It'll be a blessing for somebody else when we go into glory, but it's not really ours. Um, so we've done everything that we can do to try and make it comfortable in our latter years, <laughs> but we still have this thing hanging over us constantly that we could lose our home or we don't know because there's no, everyone's saying there's no money. Um, we, you know, we, do you want to say something more? Go on. Um, yeah, and we noticed in the, in the plan, the 10 year plan, it talks about um, w whether the council should borrow money to fix these flats up because they were built in 1972, they're quite old, or whether um, put the rates up. And um, we're constantly hearing from people that work on the sites there that um, oh, you, you're lucky to have these places and um, don't speak up too much, you know, and um, you're not rate payers. Um, that's an insult because many of the people that are in these flats, these council flats, were rate payers and they paid rent rates for years, you know, and that's why all the things that have happened in this council um, precinct have happened. And we're, we ask for something like a clothesline um, to be put in because we've got a clothesline in the, that's in the shade all during the winter and we can't dry our clothes. And we're told, well, you know, you're lucky to have, by the workers, well, you're lucky to have these places. Now, we were promised a, 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 secu a security fence. No, just a fence. A fence, yeah, two years ago around the property. Um, I know that they did put in a um, a, a big wood fence to keep kids from running through, but we've had we've had um, many cars broken into. We're right by the laneway on Oxford Street that goes through to McDonald's, and there's a lot of things that have happened there during the night. Um, even a, I think a girl was raped or something. Um, and we've asked for a fence to give us a bit of security there two years ago, and we were promised it, um, and it's never happened. Um, we heard through the grapevine that uh, the plans for the fence had been ripped up because one of the councillors said that it was too expensive and we couldn't have it. Um, and, but we have never heard, we've, n we've not had any communication, no writing. Phil and I went to a lot of trouble to try and get some security in the village because we, I've gone through so many times of horrible stuff happening. People at front door, one guy drunk who'd come through the alleyway, leaning on our door, mm. and I'm like, and we're waiting for the police to come, and he keeps on trying the handle. That's only one episode. We've had kids coming through the village, probably on P, um, smashing all the lighting. The repairs for that comes out of our rent money. It's just horrible. We. We need, we need some sort of peace and that little fence is all we ask for. We only want something that represents a fence. You know, this far and no further, you know, this, this surrounds our village. We don't want some 10 foot high fence, but we would like, we're the forgotten old, we would like some help, please, from you guys, because we all, for, everyone's too scared to make a noise in case they lose their home. And so, uh, we're not representing everybody else. We're here um, on our own, but we're asking for everybody else as well. Yeah, I think that's just about it. Um, yeah, and as far as, you know, a lot of these um, flats are in disrepair and some are getting uh, mouldy curtains and things like that. And um, I know it's in the long-term plan to, to um, make them more uh, a drier homes. Um, but it doesn't seem to be happening very fast, and um, we keep getting told, oh, you know, there's not enough money. There's, it's more important to do other things in the community than them. Um, we, f we feel like forgotten old people sometimes, but anyway, that's, that's enough for me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to us. Well, thank you, Phil and Evie, for coming and pre presenting to us today and not realising that you would be talking to a large room full of people. You did very, very well. Oh, and thank you. 
uh, look, it, it is important that we hear the concerns of our residents and our villagers, so thank you for taking the time to come and share with us, and we will certainly, um, you know, follow up with staff with regards to those sort of operational matters which don't typically come to us as elected members. But well, I, I, oh, sorry, and I, I did... I just wanted to say we're certainly appreciative of the new things that have been put in the village, like we've got a better uh, rubbish system now, Okay. And the speed bumps that have been put in have, have slowed people down, which is really good. So I, I don't want to sound like uh, we're not appreciative of the things that have, yeah, have no, happened to no, you. Not at all, not at all. And I also appreciate, you know, your frustrations with the uncertainty around the future of the villages. Unfortunately, um, last year, with the challenges we had, it did mean the, the review we're undertaking has been delayed, um, but certainly we are focused on moving ahead with that to provide the residents with, with some certainty. And I can assure you that there is absolutely no intention uh, for anyone to lose their homes. So, Thank you. Um, well, we, we would just appreciate a little, little bit more communication, please. Yeah. That's the big thing. We just don't get told. We never got told we weren't going to have that. We got told we were. We were actually promised that fence, you know, be it this high. So um, just communication, please. Okay. We can always improve in that area. Thank you. <laughs> Thank uh, you just very before much. you disappear, yeah. I'll just, just check in case any of the councillors did have any questions for you. No, you're, you're off the hook. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you Thank again you. for coming today. And our final uh, submitter for the day is John Warren from the Napier branch of Forest and Bird. Welcome. Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, Lynn Anderson and John Warren from the Napier Branch of Forest and Bird. I believe we're last on the list. Uh, the Napier Branch have over 500 members in Napier and we also uh, have the support of the National Office. So thank you for enabling us to uh, make this brief presentation. Uh, just to let you know, John will be presenting first, and John is a water engineer who's been involved with stormwater management in Toronto and other locations. So thank you, Lynn. So the first item I'll refer to is the Ahariri Estuary Master Plan, which we've already heard other presentations on, so I hope this is complimentary. And so we specifically recommend that you identify specific water quality objectives for the estuary and the timeline for achieving those uh, objectives. We haven't been able to find that specificity anywhere in your plan, uh, and we do recommend that you give that high priority. And uh, an area of my own personal sort of um, work that I've done over my life, uh, I find that the impact of urban stormwater discharge contamination in the estuary is not clearly identified and may not be completely understood. And this is quite common um, in New Zealand. The total existing contaminant load that's discharged into the estuary should be clearly identified from all sources, including urban stormwater. And, uh, and clear methodology should be identified how to reduce these discharges so to achieve the defined quality objectives that I've referred to previously. Studies over a long period of time have shown that the annual discharge of contaminants in urban stormwater is similar to the annual discharge of contaminants in the sanitary wastewater, about 50-50. Uh, despite this similarity, stormwater is allowed to discharge untreated into the receiving waters, whereas we do take some care, um, uh, and more so, I think, over time, with respect to the sanitary wastewater. And of course, the impacts of all other discharges should be addressed, and in all cases, we're of the opinion that the restoration of water quality in the Ahariri estuary should be given priority over issues that don't address environmental quality. And I certainly wouldn't say over and above taking care of people in, in the retirement homes that we've, we've just heard about. I'm not saying that at all. And you've allocated $100,000 per year for three years to identify quality issues and objectives, and I just wonder whether that is sufficient. 
And just an offhand thought that I had coming in here is my recollection is that uh, the removal of chlorine from the um, water supply is in the, your study is a cost of about $100 million. And uh, my thought is if you have that kind of money, it would be much better spent on the restoration of the quality of the Ahariri estuary. The second item that I refer to is the three water reform. And uh, you know the, the government proposals for reform of three waters are very significant, and you know, have a potential very serious uh, impact in Napier and the rest of New Zealand. And my recommendation is that in your submissions to the government, you do, I, you do uh, emphasize to them the issues of uh, urban stormwater discharges and the quality of those discharges throughout New Zealand, that, th that in the three waters reform, uh, I'm of strong opinion that, the, that this issue should be properly addressed. And I'm concerned that in New Zealand, it hasn't been given sufficient priority. And I would hope that you would uh, put that forward as an issue to be dealt with. And there are many contaminants in urban stormwater. I just mentioned one just uh, as an example. If you ever go through the shelves of a uh, hardware store and look at the liquids and solids that are proposed to be discharged onto lawns and other areas in the city, every drop, every part of that substance goes into the stormwater and eventually is discharged to the receiving water. And that is just one example of the contaminants that are discharged in urban stormwater. So I'd say Napier should address both the quality decline that has occurred and then work to achieve the highest possible standards, environmental standards, and not necessarily simply adhere to national standards, but maybe say we want to do better than those national standards. And just one final item, uh, sea level rise. I don't see anything about this in the 10-year um, plan. I may have missed it, but uh, this is potentially an extremely serious issue for Napier because the parts of Napier that came up in the earthquake uh, are a very, very low lying, and a one or two meter rise in sea level is a real serious issue uh, for Napier. And um, there are only really two options. One is to protect, and the other is to retreat. And uh, they're both massive issues, and uh, I really do think you should start thinking seriously about those issues. So on to Lynn. Uh, I'll be speaking about the proposed Ahiriri Regional Park. Uh, we certainly support the development of this new wetland, although, as you're aware, there's not a lot of detail at this stage, but we appreciate you have to start somewhere with the concept. But such a regional park is, really has huge potential and is a great opportunity to give something back to nature when so much has been previously taken away. As it is now, and as you've heard, the Ahariri estuary is seriously degraded with sediment, tube worm, untreated stormwater, at times wastewater overflow and pollutants from the industrial area. So it seems a plan is needed with quality objectives and timelines to restore and maintain the overall health of the estuary. Uh, also the effects of climate change built into all plans. So firstly, we urge that cleanup happens before and in conjunction with any development of a new wetland. Our main concern is that recreational opportunities will become the dominant force, and Forest and Bird strongly urge that the proposed Ahiriri Regional Plan is first and foremost a wildlife refuge. Recreation must be carefully balanced so that wildlife is not disturbed especially by dogs, which are presently not well controlled in the estuary area. However, we do recognise that it's important for people to get the opportunity to view, enjoy and appreciate the area. And educational opportunities are also very important. If people can appreciate and enjoy the area, they'll be more inclined to want to protect it and be more inclined to want to protect biodiversity in general. We also urge that significant areas such as Southern Marsh and the North Channel be left alone and be forever free of people, bikes and dogs. As I believe you've heard a few times that the North Channel is one of the few areas where New Zealand, in New Zealand where Australasian bittern breed. This bird is about as rare as the kākāpō and if that area is opened up, it will be the end of the bittern in that area. It's a sad statistic. 
uh, that 80% of New Zealand bird species have a concerning threat status. That is, they are either threatened, endangered, or at risk, declining in number or in some sort of trouble. And it's not just New Zealand birds. Thousands of New Zealand species of flora and fauna are in that category. And we all need to do everything we can to try to turn these statistics around. And we see the proposed regional park as a small opportunity to do this. It's not really realised how absolutely critical the situation is with the loss of our natural biodiversity. We know new wetland areas can be done well. Look at West Shore Scrapes, which has proved a great roosting place for the couple of hundred God Godwits, Kuaka, which visit us each summer. And where Tarapuka, New Zealand's endemic black-billed gulls, have twice set up a nesting colony. I realise that Waikahu Wetland is largely the work of Hawke's Bay Regional Council, but I would like to say what a great success it has been. In February last year, I took two prominent English park rangers, or top birders, there, and they couldn't believe it was such a new wetland. They told me of wetlands in the UK that had been attempted to be developed, but had just sat there for years, virtually devoid of life. So our point is, you can get it wrong. We also have concerns due to the narrow inlet outlet under the Pandora Bridge that sufficient tidal flow will be able to reach the newly proposed area of wetland. So before any action with developing the proposed regional park, we do urge robust ecological investigation, see what's there, um, protect what's there, and see what we can uh, develop and put back in the way of nature. We have a lot of local expertise, so we really urge you to engage with those people, uh, to plan precisely and to work closely with all stakeholders, Department of Conservation, Regional Council, local iwi, etc. So it's just do it well, get it right, but first and foremost, make it a wildlife refuge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn and John. Do we have any questions from councillors? No, so thank no, you very the much of the day. for your time today. Thank you. Okay, we, we scheduled for a break at three, but I think we'll call it now, um, have 15 minutes to have a quick cup of tea, refresh, and then we will... Uh, Readjourn to start our deliberations.